quiz number four goes live today. Those of you who are coming in right now, the code to sign in is 4653. Very good. So we're getting very good at this, I'm glad to see. All right. Okay, um, any questions uh, uh, regarding the course up to now? Going smoothly? Good. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, Robin Chase as much as I did in our last session. Um, this business about autonomous vehicles is, is game changing and uh, I, I, I'm glad that you got to hear about it here. Um, for those of you who are just walking in, the code is 4653, 4653. Um, our next, next uh, time on Thursday, we're going to have a very interesting uh, guest named Jesse Barkan, and he is uh, basically created his own industry, um, a kind of consulting business that uh, I think you'll find very, very interesting because he comes to commercial real estate from the standpoint of the legal profession, the regulatory environment, design and placemaking. Um, and marketing. It's a, it's a really, he's an interesting person and I think you will find uh, maybe as you are trying to craft your own ideas about your careers, you might find uh, him extremely interesting. He's a young guy who's, who's really um, uh, done well. Okay, for those of you who are just coming in, the number is 4653, okay, 4653. I'm gonna go ahead and get started uh, on introducing today's guests. Um, and we are very lucky to have today uh, the architects of the new Northeastern I Interdisciplinary Research uh, Facility, uh, just on the other side of the Orange Line tracks. And uh, they come to us from Payette, an interdisciplinary design practice based here in Boston. The two of them, uh, Kevin Sullivan and Robert Schaffner, are both gonna be joining us for this conversation, which I think will be very relevant to the stuff we've been talking about. Kevin Sullivan joined Payette in 1987, became a partner in 1998, and succeeded Jim Collins as president in 2014. His body of work includes seminal science, healthcare, and campus planning projects, which have been consistently recognized nationally for their attention to detail, social geometry, and the integration of the landscape into transformative spaces. Kevin believes that an in-depth understanding of a building's program and site provide the fundamental palette for each project. This knowledge is combined with the concept of transparency, both literal and phenomenal. That pairing means something to archi architects of a, of a certain generation, including mine. <laughs> to provide a deep, now, a deep logic for forms and spaces. Kevin received his Bachelor of Architecture from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and his Master of Architecture from Harvard. Robert Schaffner uh, joined Payette in 1981 and he became a part of the firm's expansion into facility, uh, research facility design. After completing seminal research projects for leading institutions, such as Mass General Hospital and Princeton University, he led the firm's first academic project, a severance chemistry addition renovation at the College of Worcester. Seeing this as an opportunity to further expand the practice, Bob helped de develop Payette's strong presence in college, university, science, facility planning and design. He has led a number of science center projects at prestigious colleges and universities which is, have positively transformed entire campus precincts. He received his Bachelor of Architecture from the Rhode Island School of Design uh, in 1981. Please join me in welcoming Kevin and Bob to our class. Thanks. Should be, but I'm still seeing those at the university. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Um, I'm Kevin Sullivan. This is my partner, Bob Schaffner, and uh, we're delighted uh, to be here today talking to you about this project. We see it as a transformative project 
on a number of different levels for uh, Northeastern, for the campus, for the city, and really for the culture of science at Northeastern. We really see it as pretty much a game changer. Um, a couple things about our firm before we get started. Um, we're, uh, we're a Boston-based firm. We're about 140 people. We like to think of ourselves working much like uh, a think tank. Um, when we work, we really look at the patterns of social geometry and, and, and how they interface at the campus le level as well as uh, in terms of the use. Um, we're fanatics about transparency and also uh, building science. And mo many of these things have really manifested themselves in this project. We're, reason we're a reasonably well-known firm. Uh, we've won a number of uh, design awards nationally uh, in the past year. One of them, uh, the National University of Ireland, was awarded uh, the Code Award, which awards the most sustainable, one of the most sustainable designs in the world. Um, we also have a number of projects under construction here in Boston that are pretty interesting to go look at. Northeastern is one of them. We have a science center at BU and another at Tufts. And all those projects, you'll see a fairly interesting array and exploration of surface texture that's really part of that. Uh, we have a fab lab. It's in Charlestown. We look at different ways to, to sort of influence our, our craft by exploring uh, sort of rapid prototyping. Uh, that was very much part of this project that we used some prototyping to really explore different strategies on the fenestration, and we'll show you that shortly. Um, locally and nationally, as I mentioned, we've won uh, a number of different design awards, so we're pr pretty well regarded. Uh, I just lost something here. Get everybody car sick here. Yeah. All right. So now on to, on to this project. So the Northeastern ISEC, ISEC, which is an interdisciplinary science and engineering center, is about 234,000 gross square feet, cost about $225 million. And you can see the array of programs that make up the building. It includes teaching labs, uh, research labs, large auditoriums, outdoor spaces. And it's really earmarked by a couple significant things. It's building architecture, but also the landscape connection that's going to connect it to the main uh, campus. So this is the site. It's located on the Columbus Avenue uh, parking lot, really sandwiched in between two uh, parking garages. It's a fairly nondescript parcel. And I think one of the opportunities of the project was to lint to link the site back to the main campus, but also to reconnect it with the city, uh, with the Roxbury neighborhood. Um, if you look at the main campus architecture along the um, MBTA tracks and the uh, Amtrak tracks along there, you'll notice that really it, uh, the buildings have a back towards Roxbury. And it was really a fundamental idea of this project and this site to sort of open up the campus and to actually have it face Roxbury and face the campus and really uh, galvanize this area as a way to allow future growth into the Roxbury neighborhood in a way that would be fairly synergistic for Northeastern. So we see this as really changing uh, some of the fundamental boundaries of the campus. With this in mind, uh, for us conceptually, we like to start with diagrams or analogies or metaphors for, for our projects. And, and for this one, it really had to do with flow, the flow of movement across the site uh, connecting these two different precincts and really the, the understanding of how this idea could maybe inform the idea uh, for a fairly uh, dramatic new iconic uh, architecture for Northeastern. This was a competition model that we used to win the project. So at this point, uh, we were trying to have this dramatic uh, landscape bridge, which we called the arc, that linked life sciences and engineering and connected with the new campus. Um, it it uh, comprised about 660,000 gross square feet. 
And when we looked at that project, we sort of uh, thought about it as almost like a shell, the shell of an oyster where you have hard shells on the perimeter against the parking garages with a very uh, sort of uh, soft connective tissue on the inner, the inner world of this precinct. And you'll see how that sort of translates to the architecture shortly. So that back to the master plan and then really a campus diagram that's all about sort of the compression of pedestrian movement through the site uh, connecting Roxbury and the Fenway. And this is a particularly important one, this sort of compression that comes through the site is really something that became the organizing tool for us in thinking about the architecture. This was the initial diagram that we used for the master plan that sort of shows these connective forces coming from the east and the west side of campus around uh, the main library connecting life sciences and engineering through uh, the new ISEC. Um, you'll see there's uh, some future buildings shown on this site and very much the plan was to think about those. As the design has evolved over the last two years, um, it's become more of a singular pedestrian landscape connection across, um, across the tracks uh, going between the Snell Library um, and the engineering building on the left. Uh, it's a phased project, so there are a number of different, different iterations for how that could occur. Uh, presently, what you see under construction is this first phase, which is the 220,000 square feet, the best pedestrian product, uh, connection and in in this very animated uh, landscape that connects it with the campus. Uh, the landscape is really seen as uh, a series of outdoor rooms, so you have an open plaza along Columbus Avenue, there's a cafe that abuts the building, a terrace landscape that uh, sort of connects this uh, outdoor room with the, the bridge level and then a terrace overlooking the tracks and a fairly animated bridge that connects it with the main campus. So in the following sort of sequence, we're gonna talk about the bridge, the thermal overcoat that defines the envelope and then some of the social geometry of the building. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so as Kevin said, I'm Bob Schaffner. And um, it's important to reiterate just a couple of points about <clears throat> what Kevin, fundamental beginnings of the project. And the way, being that this is a design thinking class, it's important to impart what was our thinking before there was ever a concept. It really began more from the notion of, in our opinion, there's uh, the idea of putting a new research building, which would largely house new researchers that are being recruited as you're amping up the quality of, of the experience in Northeastern is to not have it an ivory tower, not have it really feel separated. And the tracks were a pretty fundamental division of a potential campus being expanded. These were the, this was the first academic building pretty much to go on that side of the campus as opposed to the housing and administrative functions that are there now. So this idea of the linkage became more important. And in fact, I think we won the competition more on the idea of the crossing as an experience, something that would be of interest to people to do rather than oh gosh, I have to cross the tracks to go to the other side. The architecture then followed. So when Kevin was talking about the notion of flow, that whole thing was really about that idea of movement. There is another thing that he didn't mention, and that's that um, the president wanted something that Boston's never seen before, or in fact, that no one's ever seen before in terms of architecture. It's kind of a fascinating thing to be told as an architect, right? Make something different that's never been seen. That was a challenge, and in fact, it put us out of our comfort range. So the idea was that first gesture, this was the phase one project. I thought maybe what I'd do is spend a little bit of time talking about the bridge, which was really the fundamental beginning of the project. So here's a view. These are different kind of computer models, a little less rendered, but they'll show the, the, um, the idea of the bridge was a weathering steel uh, crossing that met all the objectives of the rail agencies, which are pretty challenging, and tried to make an experience out of that. So these are a couple different views from, in, in this case, down below. And from the air, it shows this gesture, this uh, sinuous gesture that crosses the tracks and then continues its way down to Columbus Ave. And that becomes an accessible route for people from the Roxbury neighborhood to Fenway. This was of great interest to the city of Boston when we were going for approvals to see this linkage of these neighborhoods. Northeastern saw it as an intellectual bridge for the campus itself. So it served both functions together. The, uh, the way that accessible, uh, accessibility will be met on the uh, north side in between Snell and Egan will be via an elevator and a stair uh, to get the accessibility there. 
But as we look at the, um, and then phase two is a notion right now, how that next 600,000 square feet might happen. We're trying to keep an eye on that. The city was also, uh, they made it imperative for this college to do the uh, to do the urban space, the plaza, as part of phase one. So it's, which is good because if you know, uh, many times in projects, landscape gets cut uh, very quickly and not to have it actually as the basis was a nice thing to have as a start point. But these are uh, different views from uh, the air looking at that bridge form and then with phase two coming in later. Um, in terms of the tools we use, we've got a number of modeling tools in the office to try to, to help set up the geometries for a bridge like this. We're working with a company called Arup Bridge Engineers out of uh, New York on the design of it, and we're, we're pretty much setting up the framework and the geometries, and they're executing the engineering for it. And it's got this wonderful system of uh, Core 10 weathering steel that tips itself away so that when you're in it, even though it has the height, it still feels somewhat open. And it's got these gills that open up and it allow you to see um, different things, whether it's city views or views of the ISCC itself. So we use these tools to get in and look at different uh, arrays of the uh, fins, how they might work. In this case, you'll see a grouping of, uh, on the left bottom, you'll see a couple different iterations of how to treat the end towards the uh, Columbus Ave side. So there are a few different versions of that used through this modeling tool before we settled on the final, which is close to this. And we did look at perforating it a bit. Someone was worried about, is the experience too enclosed as you go through? But as we looked at it, we realized it was, it was too visually complex. So we did not execute the perforated version. This is a view, once we hand it over to our rendering group, to what's it like in the experience, in this case, in the evening. And you can see these glass uh, and steel gills opening up as you approach the ISCC in the evening from the campus. The rest of it is that, as Kevin mentioned, the project is a series of outdoor rooms in terms of the landscape approach. And the plaza, this is the plaza in front of the building. You can see a slope lawn where uh, people can hang out in an amphitheater-like setting. And this is the accessible walkway as it walks, goes down towards Columbus Ave. So some nice renderings of that. This happens to show um, the approach from down on Columbus Ave. And then this is the approach from Egan and, uh, or the main campus looking towards uh, the library. So this is where we'll have stairs and an elevator to reach the accessibility. So I thought I'd transition a little bit. Let's talk a bit about the exterior because it was all fine and dandy to have this notion of an organic architecture. Uh, something never, no one's seen before. How do you do it, especially when an institution doesn't want to spend a lot more money necessarily? So going back to the original model gesture, again, the idea that there was a framework of robust, sort of more traditional building forms on the perimeter with the flamboyance and the sort of more organic parts towards the middle, as Kevin mentioned, that oyster form. So in terms of our design process, we were out of our element from the start. So we had to look for ways to illustrate a potential vision for this project using fat markers like you could imagine. And then we had folks in our 3D group, uh, visualizations group, try to uh, do these sort of digital collages. So what I'm gonna do is just morph through a bunch of those early iterations so you can see what the gestures were that captured Northeastern's imagination about this kind of architecture that it could be. And again, I'll just flip through a few versions. And some of these will remind you of how it evolved into today's uh, form. And we did look at that in the evening too. Very much this idea of movement and flow were the drivers behind this. And then as it switches to, there's a view coming up from the street side from Columbus Avenue. Let's look at it from there as well. In this case, again, I'll morph through this idea of digital collage, which turned out to be a really interesting process for us in terms of how to communicate design possibilities and how it ended up how can you create this out of architecture that can be built? So the result of this, this is one of the later renderings that we did uh, before uh, it went into construction. And the way it was designed was using every tool we had for parametric modeling that linked into our energy model. So we were able to take a relatively simple, even though it looks like curving forms, it's faceted glass behind those vertical fins that are actually vertical. They don't bow out or anything. And the way it's made is through this exoskeleton of sun shading, which protect not only the heat gain for the western and southern light, 
but also for glare. So this was finely tuned to a performance model. And then you can see a cross section through on the left is that office bar, which is the very curvy piece. The lab bar is much less curvy, but it has some organic shape. And then uh, energy wise, where this project was meant to uh, fit in terms of our portfolio, it's one of the highest performing buildings that we have in terms of energy use. So that was a primary driver for this project to be at the very front edge of energy use. In terms of the uh, imagery, this is the main entrance from Columbus Ave, which sees the fissure between the office pods and the lab bar. Um, and I think, Kevin, were you going to take over here? No, you just no? go through okay. some of the exteriors. All right, we'll just pop through. Oh, yeah, so the construction version of what this looks like now. And this is a view, I believe this is Burke Street, if I remember correctly, um, which I was kind of thinking it'd be nice if they turn it one way the other direction, really, because I think this would be a lot of fun to look at down there. But there were a few fundamental uh, things done during the process. The idea of using anodized bronze, uh, aluminum fins, that bronze color gives it a sense of uh, life. And, it, and each, each piece is slightly different, so it has a quality similar to how wood has that character to it, and it, as it sets itself off from the laboratory bar. And then the grooves, the reveals, give it this extra sense of flow and movement as we walk through. And it was a nice thing to use two different colors of anodizing, so those cutouts are one tone lighter, so it gives a little extra sense of depth. And then you can sort of start sensing where the catwalks are, and the technique that gives it that curve form was all done through the armature as opposed to dealing with the glass in a curving form. So we get a lot of effort out of that. The other wing, the bar wing, uh, lab bar, is done with an aluminum panel. And where the windows are, this idea of layering, it also has a layered overcoat of uh, this horizontal sun shading that exists. And it, it makes a nice counterpoint of the lab to the office bars. In, uh, originally, we had a screen that wrapped that entire wing, but it was uh, too costly. So what this illustrates is that where there are windows, there are bar uh, horizontal rods. Where we don't have windows, we use the profiled metal panel to simulate the shape. And as you look up, it almost becomes one surface. So it was a cost-saving but uh, effective way of approaching it. And again, this idea of layering, always layers and layers wrapping around the building. And this is the lab bar, the face that's towards the garage, uh, Columbus Ave garage. And Kevin was going to wrap up by talking a bit about the social geometry of the building. So thank you. So um, it was interesting watching Bob do that because I think one of the things uh, it's important to understand is when we started this process, we didn't know exactly where we were going in terms of how we would build that skin and how would we, how would we put it together. And so the idea of collage actually freed us up to really explore that. And then we just, we, we had to just figure out how to do it gradually over time. It's a unique project for us in that regard in that the process really helped us define the end where in a lot of instances, we sort of know what the end is as we start to develop it. In, in terms of the social geometry, I think that was a very important part of this. How do you bring that sort of robust language of the site and the organization, and how do you embed that in the building as well? And uh, we used these diagrams really to talk about how we wanted the spaces in the building to work. And this first one is really showing the ground floor that's abutting all the landscapes that Bob talked about. So you have a large lecture hall, you have a cafe, you have a main sort of gathering area that's going to be used for informal lectures or just a, a place to meet. And then you have a series of uh, very uh, flexible classrooms and teaching labs that are uh, very open and uh, connected to this public space. But even the teaching lab actually has an address on Columbus Ave, so you can see what's going on in, in there. So bringing the campus in was really important, and when you think ultimately when it opens, you'll really realize that all the floor materials sort of flow inside and outside. On the upper, flow, upper level of the building, you really start to see the forms that sort of define the architecture on the outside. So you have this very repetitive, long and curved uh, lab wing where all the experimental research is, as well as some of the uh, collaboration and workspace areas for the staff. 
And the, the, the most dynamic architectural element actually happens to be the offices and the conference rooms uh, for the faculty that are connected uh, to this uh, uh, laboratory wing through a series of bridges. In a different climate, that atrium might be uh, outdoor space. In this climate, it's indoor space. What I'm gonna show you now is just sort of some three-dimensional built drawings that are gonna show you how it's organized. So here you see the pedestrian bridge, the landscape space, uh, the, the office uh, beams are a term we, we called them during the project, and then the laboratory bar. If you take off the lid, this is a typical uh, research floor. So uh, on, the, on the right side, you have the laboratory bar against the parking garage that is laminated in three distinct layers. Um, sort of high, high energy support spaces, open laboratories, writing desks, and then uh, the offices on the perimeter uh, with informal break areas and, and uh, interaction zones in between the different massing elements, but also uh, within them as well. On the second level, this is the level that connects to the pedestrian bridge. Um, it has some uh, bioengineering teaching labs, the departmental office for bioengineering, as well as some additional research spaces. And then uh, on the ground level, at the level of Co Columbus Avenue, you have the atrium, the cafe, um, the, s the slew of classrooms, and a very large auditorium. This just shows you the same section that Bob showed you to just give you an understanding of the programmatic layering. Uh, below grade, there's some fairly complex um, high-end uh, imaging space uh, below the main public level of the facility. This is the, uh, the engine that sort of drives it, the typical lab module. And you'll see that even in the, the layout of the lab module, there is an idea about energy where there's uh, high energy and low energy spaces, and these were used also to drive some of the uh, envelope strategies that Bob was talking about. Uh, the layering is showing you sort of the writing desks, the open laboratory work areas, and then the uh, support rooms that support them. And this was designed to be very flexible for a number of different lab typologies. This is a, a section, uh, I mean, a uh, perspective of the main atrium looking at this uh, main spiral stair that connects the ground floor of the atrium with the top of the atrium. Uh, there are a range of pretty interesting uh, s sort of collaboration spaces and furnishings that complement this. What you're seeing here is some of the activity on the bridges that go across the atrium. And this just shows you sort of what it looked like a couple months ago under construction. So the space on the inside is actually going to be uh, equally arresting, I think, as the space on the outside. These are just a couple little coming attractions. One of the things on a project like this that's pretty unique is we got to design a building at the level of the campus, at the level of the city, at the, at the le level of the building, but then at the level of the furniture. And you'll see inside the building that there was equal attention um, spent on some fairly creative furnishings that are going to um, be in all the public spaces, but also in some of the technical uh, spaces in the building. And this just gives you a sense of some of the furnishings that would be in the atrium or on this terrace that's overlooking the atrium, uh, finding their way uh, into some of the uh, upper floors as well. In the writing desks, there's a lot of transparency sort of linking some of the writing desks and the staff work areas with the research labs. A lot of color, uh, particularly where you move and circulate. A lot of transparency through the building. So this is, this is a building where you can stand on one side of the building and see all the way through it in both directions. So it's fairly unique in, in that um, in that regard. This happens to be a staff break area but in, up in the uh, middle of the office core, some of the lounge areas that are on the bridges. And really looking back at that diagram, you can see that even in some of the workspaces, there was an attitude about spaces people would gather, collaborate, or work, uh, start to uh, inform those furniture selections in which we looked at n a number of different prototypes for these spaces. So the building's going to be a living experiment in terms of how the furnishings are looked at on all the floors. So it's probably going to be one of the more interesting things to analyze and look at and look at the changing habitation in the building as you uh, walk through the building over time. So that concludes, I think, our, our sort of 
formal uh, talk about the building. I hope you sort of have a good sense of what it is. Um, I think it, it, it's been a remarkable opportunity to work on a project like this that sort of pushes you at so many different levels in terms of uh, pushing you into an architecture that you hadn't explored on this level before or even pushing you into uh, sort of some new programmatic groupings that you hadn't explored before. And Bob had mentioned a little bit Joseph Aoun, your president, is sort of a force in pushing us harder, 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 harder. Um, so on some level, um, uh, I think we look at him as actually one of the key collaborators in this project because there are many different places that uh, I think the institution could have lost the courage to go forward, and he never did. And uh, it's, it helped us get to this point. Yeah. Well, thank you both very much. So. Let's a seat at, the, at our Charlie Rose table. Um, well, you know, that last bit anticipated um, the first question I'd like to ask you because one of the, first of all, I, I already told you we're going to have Joseph uh, Aoun as a uh, guest at the, in the last class, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with him not only about the future of higher education, but also about the process around this building because yeah. when I, you know, the first question I, I like to ask about people designing something complex like this is, how long did it take you to get to where you felt like you knew what the problem was to be solved? In other words, yeah. when we talk about empathize yeah. and, 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 and define, it seems like in this project, defining what the problem was was a big it, deal. Yeah, I think both of us will answer this, but that's like the one thing that we sort of knew at the beginning, mm. which was uh, the problem was not about the building. Right. It was about the connection to the campus. Right. And so when we interviewed for the project, <laughs> that was almost all we talked about, mm -hmm. was the importance yeah. of the connection. We showed two different things. We, um, there were, t well, there was this idea of, again, avoiding the ivory tower of the building itself. But then um, what we found was that as a campus develops, you know your front quad is on uh, uh, Huntington Ave, Krenzman, and every building that came afterwards always was facing that way in a sense, around that. And you know you keep backing up to the tracks and closer and closer, and it's really the butt of every building against the tracks. Well, frankly, the master plan looked like a version for that for the, when we saw it. It looked like it was doing the same thing on Columbus Ave, creating a little quad and then backing up to the tracks. Right. And we were thinking how reverse that was. So it was kind of a by digging and scratching at the the planning that had been done already. Everybody's critical, right? I mean, that's the what we do. Yeah. So you critique it, and yeah. that's how we come up with this new thing by turning everything sideways and opening it. Right. right. Well, the, what I'm hearing there is from an urban design standpoint, from a planning standpoint, the, sort, the need to sort of have two faces, mm -hmm. two fronts for this building as opposed to a, a traditional front and back. Uh, well, the other thing I was getting at is, is what you were alluding to at the, at the end about President Aoun's, um, you know, will to, to execute such an atypical building. And, and, you know, when I s first you know, I, I remember this process started probably three or four years ago, maybe more than yeah, that. I don't yeah, know, but yeah. it takes a long time. Yeah. Um, and you know, I remember thinking that the um, clearly this is a complex problem because this is not the first and most obvious solution to a research building on a college campus in the United States, right? In other words, this is not what most right. of them look like. So if that's the case, there must be another set of problems that they're solving and. You know, I'll toss out there that it seems to me that in a way, the most critical problem for this building to solve was a rhetorical one about the identity, mm -hmm. the transforming identity of an institution. It absolutely couldn't look like the gray glazed brick of this building and the ones on Huntington. It couldn't look like the red brick of the buildings that Northeastern later sort of bought and repurposed. It had to look like something else altogether. And uh, I think it, I think it, really does and it's really impressive in that way. So. Well that was, you know, the, there are a couple of these things, George, where your client gives you a directive. Mm -hmm. um, this was almost a directive, yeah, yeah. which was um, this, this building has to look like nothing else in Boston. Right. This building has to announce this great leap that Northeastern is making, not just as a phys physical campus, but also 
in terms of its research agenda. Right, right. It, it, Northeastern wanted this building to look like, look, I deserve to be at the table with right. MIT and right. with all these other yes. things. In right. fact, I'm going to reach further than you guys right. ever did. Right. 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 And on some level, um, that was that 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 was the ambition that was quite clear right. 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 at the start. And uh, not all clients give you that type right. of direction. That's re it's, it's really interesting because if you think about it, as the students, if you think about, um, you know, you there's no way you're going to get to an ideal solution if, you have not, if you're not clear what the terms of yeah. that success yeah. are, at least in some ways. Obviously, the terms of that conversation continued to change throughout this process. In other words, uh, after, after mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine that, e that on the client side, they could have, they knew everything they wanted. Oh, no. No, 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 it was no, you know, you'd hear words like iconic building. Right. You know, or uh, gateway building, right. something like that. What we had trouble with the most was this idea of trying to replicate Krenzman Quad on Columbus Ave, because in a way, I'm not sure this is the edge of your campus. I don't right. know where in Roxbury the edge of the campus actually is. I'd rather have this a, uh, a filter, say, yeah, yeah. between the two parts of campus. Right. So it's more that, and, right. and that was a big thing to get through. And it was also fascinating to see how the city's goals, uh, they had their own idea of what they wanted to see here. They're not always well aligned with what an institution wants, but they did align pretty well. Right, right, so, right. you know, the idea of public means. Right, so right. the ground floor, you know, for example, uh, in the early part of this, the provost wanted a building with 100% research. And if you can imagine no teaching spaces in this building, where is it that anyone would want to go? Mm -hmm. So by having classrooms, lecture rooms, cafe, et cetera, thank God that ground floor has life to it. Mm -hmm. City would frankly love to have had on Columbus Ave probably a retail spot and something else. Right, right, right. The cafe right. is technically public, but it'll be interesting how that plays out. You know, this is, this is a, an example of why having architects in to this course really is helpful because the, the, uh, the, the mixed nature of the performance objective or performance criteria for an urban architecture project mm. are probably as mixed as almost any kind of design project mm -hmm. that you could think of. What mm -hmm. I mean is, if we had a, we had a, a great uh, designer from um, Burton Snowboards mm -hmm. as a guest a little while ago, and there were multiple criteria there for sure, but not that many. <laughs> right. Maybe three right. or four. Right. Yeah. And, it, but in architecture, in urban architecture where you have genuine stakeholders who are not, who don't own it, who don't use it, who, you know, but, but they're stakeholders nonetheless, they're community members, they're, this is a big enterprise taking place in a, in a large city, so the city does have an agenda, the yes. city does have interests, and, and of course they will, they'll, they'll put them forward. But I, I, I think that's, I think I that's fascinating. I think, George, there was, um, you know, often you, you hear about uh, in Boston, the Boston Redevelopment Authority or the community or the BCDC as being obstacles mm -hmm. in planning or the process, and this certainly wasn't the case here. Right. I mean, and, and this was embraced um, uh, on many different levels in terms of uh, what it was bringing the city in terms of the connections, but also from the neighborhoods. If you look at the urban planning of Roxbury and, and Boston, there's pretty much a wall yeah, yeah, that absolutely. runs along it. And this is sort of, we put a big giant hole in the wall uh, with this project. It's very true. You know, one of the things that's true about the, the student body in this course is that um, uh, not only are most of them not d architecture students, the vast, vast majority not architecture students, um, at least half of them are from other countries and, and more, m far more than half are not from Boston. Mm -hmm. So it might be worth mentioning that, for example, the Orange Line and the Amtrak lines, the so-called Southwest Corridor, mm -hmm. be are become a wall in, in Boston. And Boston has many of them. There are highways that are walls. There are, there are uh, rail lines like this that are walls. And they end up being de facto reasons why one neighborhood is different and segregated from another. And this is, uh, you know, the uh, Ruggles MBTA station, when it happened, was absolutely the first mm -hmm. hole in the wall. It, right. you, you couldn't cross almost anywhere <laughs> from one side of the Orange Line to the other until Ruggles, it's interesting, Ruggles station was a connection long before there, was a there were a lot of things to be connected. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it dates to 1986, literally 30 years ago. And 
I remember when it, when it was done, <laughs> I had just gotten to Boston and it was, wow, there's a giant barrel vault connecting uh, a parking lot to sort of nothing. Right. <laughs> it's, it's quite rare that an academic institution would do urban design at this level yeah. in yeah. a city where institutions are normally about defining a fairly particular and sacred it's a, precinct. It's a really good point. Um, you know, there's kind of two different ends of the spectrum there. There's the, there's the campuses that are walled, literally walled off. I mean, Harvard Yard is, yeah. is, has, a, has a wall separating Cambridge from the interior. Um, but then there are other universities like NYU or Boston University that have, are, are, have virtually no campus in the traditional sense of uh, where would they put a wall? Right. Where, because they, they, just, they have buildings that happen mostly in BU's case on Commonwealth Avenue, right. in NYU's case all over the sort of village area. Um, it's uh, the whole uh, notion in a city like this that has so many academic institu institutions of what's public and what's private mm -hmm. is I think a fascinating right. issue. Right. Um, Northeastern clearly has some parts that are officially and absolutely without question public in the sense that they're city streets. Mm -hmm. But then it also has some parts that are definitely under the university's domain, but, but are right. expected to be public. Right. Um, well, um, so regarding that sort of uh, uh, all the different agencies that you have to deal with and all the different constituents you deal with, I am curious, there was a master plan that preceded this done by NBBJ, mm -hmm. um, and maybe it was first done by Chan Krieger and then yeah. it became NBBJ. Um, how did, 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 was that a fruitful interaction with that? You would you that say? Yeah, we, um, the institutional master plan is something required for a place like Northeastern to be able to build. The city has to know what their overall intentions are. In this case, it was, I think, a 15 year increment mm -hmm. uh, look ahead. And this was one of maybe 20 projects that were being contemplated. Our biggest critique, as we mentioned, was this idea that I thought that it was doing the same thing this campus did, which was turn its back on that. So I think those early discussions of opening up and making it porous and making the crossing more of an event rather than a, a, a thing you have to do, yeah. a chore, right. that was the new thinking that I think that um, I can't say it was embraced right away because right. it differed from another way of approaching it. Right. But soon enough, it got such momentum that it was very clear that it was a very powerful right. yeah. thing for the. It, but it, it absolutely and definitively is not a, a quad. Right. Right. It's a brand new sort of invented type of landscape that's dealing with that getting up 18 yeah. feet and going back down right. 18 feet right. on the other side. Well, it's, it's funny. I mean, it has, a, it has a very, not to obsess with the language of design thinking, but it has a very clearly different problem to solve than a quad. Right. A quad right. ha has a, a job to be a, a space on which things right. can front. Right. Right. I right. think this is an example of, you know, where Bob and I could have had a decision to almost ignore all the design problems that were there and instead, you know, it was to embrace all of them mm -hmm. to sort of solve um, a very complex issue with, in a way that I think will ultimately be, have much more uh, impact, impact yeah. than if it had been just a, a quad at the level of the street. Right, right, right. Well, it is, if, it is really helpful to think about what if just isolated normative criteria had been followed in almost any part of this, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about the mm -hmm. urban design, meaning mm -hmm. what if it were a quad, a standard prototypical mm -hmm. uh, layered lab building, mm -hmm. and you guys I know are experts yeah. in this area, and I mean, if I asked you to show me what, what is the prototype, the working beginning of the perfectly dimensioned lab building, um, it, would, it would not look like that. what this is. And I think that's, I think, uh, that's well, not a criticism, it is a... No, but you know, it's funny you say that, because it, it, it might look flamboyant and all this and edgy, right. but um, the lab, for example, has only, I think, a 15 or 20 degree uh, kink right, near right. the middle. We're, we were surprised, actually, how much power that had. How mm -hmm. much, like if people look by the garage facade, they'll think it's curved the whole way, and it's not. It's just right. bent slightly in the middle. And then there's another thing that happens, the psychology inside the lab where people are starting, they understand the benefit of a lab that's open in terms of collaboration, but people get also afraid. Researchers don't want it too big because it feels disruptive. Right, right, By right, having right. that curve, you don't get the tunnel effect. Right, it, you right. don't know 
you're in a much bigger environment. So we have all these, so in a way, it's not that radical. And then the offices being the piece that's this right. part, they're only, yeah, it's a slight curve, you yeah, know. Yeah, so yeah. we got a lot of bang for the buck in a way that, um, right. that now, granted, to do a curved building, it has challenges also that, that are, for an architect uh, is, is really hard because most pieces of things are built are made out of straight things. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, I can only, I yeah, mean, so. you know, this revolution <laughs> is ongoing. The, the, yeah. the, the revolution that started with, with CAD and right. is now in, in very advanced 3D right. modeling and manufacturing and maybe assembly for all I know. I haven't been right. involved in, in that end of the world for a while. But yeah, so that. Uh, amazing. Um, so uh, I know that you have, uh, I, I, th I don't know, I think we may have some of the people from the Northeastern team here today. At least I told Nancy May about this. And, um, uh, but, but just on the design side, and I think this would be helpful for the students to understand how complex these things are. Because, you know, there persists in our culture a sense of the architect as a singular Thomas Jefferson-like mm -hmm, yeah. figure. And I know, and you know better than I do, how complex the teams are that execute something like this. Even I was, I, I was sort of mildly amazed even 20 years ago when I was practicing more regularly at a residential scale, the number of consultants that we had on a house mm -hmm. would be three or four or five. Yeah, <laughs> and now, like, just give us the rough contours of what the team looks like, just on the design of a, of a project. Well, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, part of the reason Bob and I are here today, two of us, is this was fairly complex just on the leadership level to, right. to work on this. But our team in the, in the house, in, in our office, you know, we had a whole group of people that were working only on the exterior of the main building. We have a whole group of people that are working only on the pedestrian crossing. Mm -hmm. We have a whole group of people that are working on the, the laboratories mm -hmm. and things like that, and then people working on the public spaces. They all work together cohesively at a, as a team, but there are also individual investigations that everyone's doing. And um, on the consultant side, that's another interesting part of this. Uh, where we have the, the mechanical engineers for the building, which is also Arup, and mm -hmm. we have the structural engineer for the building, which is a different structural mm -hmm. engineer, and then we have the bridge engineer. Mm -hmm. And then we have lighting consultants and things like that. Landscape. And the, it's yeah. Landscape, yeah. landscape yeah. is right. hugely yeah. important. Yeah. Right. And I, I can't look to a single one of those teams and, and not acknowledge that they didn't have an, a significant impact right on the overall design of the project. I think one of the most significant people might be Arab's lighting designer, you know, in terms of the bridge in a way. Like yeah, we had a I, magic moment in that where yeah. he just got what we were trying to do. You know, it's that idea that yeah. when, you're, when you're teaming with somebody and you have the beginnings of an idea, your colleague has another one, mm -hmm. but it comes to a third place. It's mm -hmm. neither of you, that, that's a great moment. And there were a number of those here. But I have to say there was one challenge in particular with this kind of architecture that looks a bit more whimsical as opposed to rational and, and straight line, a straight edge, is that a concept like this doesn't necessarily tell you how to make other subsequent decisions. Mm. So it was a little bit more playful, which was fun, but hard to, you almost want a team to know in their head, I know where I'm going with yeah, this. Yeah. Too many times questions will come up and frankly, we're co-principals, but I'm not sure we would interpret it the same way. Architecture is so crisp and clear you just know what you're doing the whole right, way. Right, so this right. was a little more it's, challenging. It's, real, it's a great segue into um, something that we've uh, read about in um, Tim Brown's book, Change by Design, mm -hmm. um, and talked about a little bit, but could probably talk about a bit more, and that is the power of a clear story. I mean, this is tied to the idea of defining the project, and perhaps the president's directive w is a big part of that story. But what you're talking about I think, is is the importance of, and, and Tim Brown talks about this in, in designing large teams, and design, you know, how do you solve complex projects that involve not just multiple experts, but multiple teams of experts, which is what you mm -hmm. guys have, both in-house and out-of-house. And, you know, I, I mean, I know, we, we, we all know and, and respect my colleague Tim Love, who's an extremely clear communicator about a design intention. Mm -hmm. They can make us, two drawings, share it with everybody on the team, and that kind of informs decisions all the way through. Right, this is a sedimentary project. We're gonna stratify it horizontally, something like this. 
I, I, I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, you said it was more playful, but at the end of the day, yeah. this is a complex thing. It's got to have a narrative at, for most parts of it. I, I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, say, the base building versus the bridge. I, I think we, we had some basic rules and ideas about how the, the building needed to interact with the ground plane. We wanted it to be very porous, and we wanted it, every opportunity that it had, mm -hmm. it needed to sort of engage, engage with the city or the landscape so that it was just a fluid, seamless thing. In terms of the building itself, um, there was that original diagram where you said the, 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 the lab bar, the exterior, needed to be more of a shell that mm. was maybe mm -hmm. a little harder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the um, office bar was more soft, mm -hmm. more translucent, transparent. Um, but this idea that we had at the beginning that there was almost like this thermal overcoat, these layers, mm -hmm. became this sort of ethic that we had that everything that we needed to do needed to reinforce the layering. Everything that we did needed to reinforce that it was curved. Everything that we did needed to reinforce something was sort of colder and harder, something was mm -hmm. softer. And, and, and just very simple things like that would become a mechanism to say, is this detail or is this thing going against right, the right, original right. idea? I, I can't stress how important that is. Um, you know, sometimes people think architects uh, use an awful lot of stray words, like we <laughs> use a lot of words that they don't, yeah. that average people don't use in their everyday lives, but it is, I think most of the time, sometimes it's pure obfuscation, but other times it's, it's trying to develop a skeleton on which you can hang decisions. Right. And I think that's right. so important for right. people to hear because right. it's not only in designing buildings that you need to do that. We've used the word parti mm -hmm. sure. or concept, you know, and that becomes the essence of the whole thing. And in fact, so I like the way you approach in the beginning by saying, is the solution actually in how you approach the problem? Mm -hmm. And then once you have, once you've really, really uh, diagrammed the problem, then you have your, your solution. Once you're there on the solution, that that concept becomes a mantra that the team just drives every single time. Right. Where you have challenges in a building this complex, some things don't necessarily mutually support other things. <laughs> you love it when everything aligns, like right, a flock right. of birds, it's all going one direction. Right. It's not always that way. We were fortunate that the person who helped us on our team on the exterior, the new tools of parametric modeling to make it have a purpose of energy responsiveness mm -hmm. uh, was remarkable. Yeah, that's because great. without those tools, how would we have, you used the word earlier today about, um, what you call it? Something about why things look the way they do. What was it? Uh, meaningful. Form. Oh, yeah. Meaningless versus right, meaningful yeah, right. difference. That <laughs> one. So this idea that how does it have a meaning beyond just being something that looked like that collage? Yeah. What's yeah, the idea? Yeah, yeah. No, that's you know, when you were educated, George, you, you probably formalism was a big oh, deal, yeah, right? Sure, sure. So I, I sort of liken what we're doing now to sort of performalism. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, that there's this other layer, this other ethic aside on top of all the sort of traditional compositional principles that you would apply that actually gives it even more substance yeah, right, and right. meaning. Well, and, and probably when, when talking about value to, with, with clients, it's very helpful that these formal right. moves I'm making actually right. have an enormous impact on right. other metrics that you're trying to pay attention to, like energy right. use and costs right, right, or right. cost of operation. Um, so, um, uh, one, one more question before I, I want to switch gears and talk about Kendall Square for a second. But um, can you just describe for us, the, I know that there was a, comp so there was a, co a design competition, an invited competition, is that yes. how it worked? So yes. like maybe 10 firms or do we well, know? So all right. I, I, I don't we know. probably can't get too into it because it gets a little funny, but it started with, um, <clears throat> frankly, the provost, I think, had someone who had done other buildings for him at other institutions. Mm. He was really excited about, we'll go on to the next one. The institution said, well, you know, you, you have to include others right, to right. play. So we thought it was a long shot from the start. Mm. So we were swinging for the fences from the start. But it was probably around eight firms probably submitted qualifications. Right. And then I think five were asked to interview. I see. And it's kind of like that. And then the interview led to us being selected. Uh, it, we treated it like a competition. But then uh, there was still a debate about maybe that other firm should still I be see. in there. And it turned into a two firm design I competition. I, 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 I asked that question not from any knowledge about yeah. that. I'm really not the slightest bit involved as, as you probably know. Uh, but I was curious to get at 
the, what the very start of this process was like for you. Like the very first day, and I guess it's before, blank paper. before, yeah, see, this is the thing. What is the white paper, the blank paper moment like? I mean, how do you guys start something like this? Is it understanding what the constraints and limitations are? Well, uh, it, it, it started with the, well, really, it started with the diagram of the campus. And what we did was we, we did a uh, constellation diagram of where sciences exist today. And then we put this across the track. And the sciences actually, if you think about it, are um, some this direction right. uh, and mm -hmm. then some that direction, engineering. And what we realized is by the new building being across the way in the middle, we were wondering that original arc design, that idea mm -hmm. of the curved bridge, could it even be a more plausible east-west route to mm -hmm. cross the tracks rather than, you know how you have to get through here now? East-west, you have to go through the student center and all that. It's not, there are good north-south paths here, right, but no right. good east-west yeah. ones. So we were wondering whether it was plausible. Right. And then we started picking up on that and we developed, it literally started from diagramming the forces of where people were now right. yeah. and where they might want to go. And we, we had a couple different uh, variations. So it was interesting in our in interactions with Northeastern leadership, you know, some that sort of worked with more traditional crossings across the track to right. some that right. were more organic. And the, 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 there was significant more interest in, I think, the, the more organic, expressive form language to the point uh, where there was a real push to, to make the form language of the crossing affect all the architecture. Right, right. So, so here's a, a funny thing that happened. When we had that first diagram of the, of the arc, and what we did, we had placeholders buildings were sort of rectangular, fuzzy sort of things in the background. The president said, what the hell are those? Right. So well, we didn't design a building yet. Right. But he doesn't know what a placeholder means. Yeah. He saw it on our papers, thought we were putting these rectangular blocks right, in. Right, right, plugged right. in. He said, well, how could that be this? And if, it, well, we, if you hire us, we'll get into it. You right, know? right. <laughs> and, and, and it didn't, it, it, you know, so this idea of placeholders wasn't cutting it for him, but mm -hmm. he wanted more. Keep going. Right, Show right, me right, something. Right. And that's right. how it turned into. Right. Well, you know, it's very interesting because you also showed, you showed some really great images, not just of the building, but of the process. Mm -hmm. And the, um, one of the things, you know, we live in an age when with tremendous specificity and precision is possible almost instantaneously, probably. How many of you uh, in the audience use uh, SketchUp? Have you ever used SketchUp? Not very many, huh? okay. I thought, I thought more engineering students would have used it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it, it, you know, you can, uh, make a, a precise shape and look at it in multiple ways very, very quickly. You very self-consciously and very intentionally, it looks like, tried to do things that did not have, did not imply finality. Um, you want to talk a little yeah, bit about absolutely. that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I, I, think, um, I think at the beginning when we were starting this project, we felt that at every, every time we started to embark on that, particularly at the conceptual competition stage, it defined the limits of the project, not the potential right, of the right, project. Right, right, right. And I think we wanted to draw, draw things in a way that didn't, did, did not close things in, right. but actually kept- Or commit us to something no, we couldn't but do. I, right. I, I, but I, I think we were very intentional in that we wanted everything we were doing to be sort of aspirational. Right. And I think that was really important. I mean, I think our firm uses conceptual models that way. We use some drawings and sketches like that in that when we were trying to actually reconcile what was the project right. now that we'd want right. it. Right, right. Whatever it had to be, it had to be as good as that aspirational model or right. as right. good right. 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 as the, the, the essence that we were trying to get in, in, in some of those renderings. And we don't do this very often, but I think this is a particular example where I think uh, we had to suspend disbelief mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and sort of own the adventure right, right, right. at a level that uh, allows you to really find and develop new things that you you wouldn't have you wouldn't have found if you had actually defined it very con right, concretely right, right, right. in that first step. Well, so this is we tried to keep it open. Um, I, I remember uh, there was a point, like Bob, when we were trying to f figure out, okay. You know, how, what is the system? Because it had to be buildable, it right, had to right, be affordable, it right. had to be all these things. And I was trying to think of another architect who's actually 
really worked on both sides of the fence in terms of really elegant orthogonal buildings and really great curvilinear buildings with really great product design, mm -hmm. and that's Aero Saarinen. Mm -hmm. And I, I was interested in how that same architect could, you know, the do the General Motors Foundation mm -hmm. and do, and models were an incredible, important part and iteration. Mm -hmm. And I think there was tremendous, it looks really simple sitting there, mm -hmm. but tremendous iteration. And the most iterated moment in the building is actually the facade that faces the parking garage. Don't you think, Bob? Yeah, oh, because that was that the hardest right, one for us huh. because it had to appear effortless mm. relative to everything right. else you we were and doing, and nothing we did looked uh, effortless. You, right? you mean you had to turn down the volume on it? It was well, not the intense part of the. Right, the, but the didn't composition. Get, it didn't get the initial uh, attention, but the other part was that originally the whole lab bar was clad with a uh, horizontal greening system that stayed off the building, like the vertical on the other side. Because of budgetary reasons, we couldn't do that anymore. Once we had to compress that into a single plane, right, right, wherever right. there weren't a lot of windows, all of a sudden, any windows you wanted had to be incised into that. Yeah, yeah. And to come up with a composition that meant something, it was brutal. That was didn't defer, and, and the rule that we had is, no matter what we do, the facade has to read as a singular surface, right, right. Not, so there, not a series of... Right. right, that's the whole point. This is the shell versus the, right. the, 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 right. the soft inner. So the, right. the, the amount of iterations we yeah. did on that right. facade... See, those diagrams are so helpful mm. to, for people yeah. to understand what you're talking about up here, the, the simple clamshell yeah. kind of uh, uh, mm. oyster shell yep. Uh, yep. diagram really is, is right. super helpful. Well. Do we have any uh, questions about our super cool new building from uh, the audience? Yes. Uh, so I have a platform here, so I'm actually really excited because I can actually sit in it and I'm going to go through the parking You go through the parking, do you go through the parking structure and yeah, on the painted I path? It's funny that the, um, uh, we have now, for a firm of our size, we have about 140 people, we have three building scientists actually working for us, so it's become part of our practice because our building typology is this kind of building, and they use so much energy, we have to make a, a dent, so it's kind of part of our culture. The institution, they feel a certain amount of pressure, it seems, uh, and maybe it's even marketing potential to have that label of, you know, we're doing the right thing. So it's become kind of a mutually supportive thing. And as far as costing extra, most of it doesn't because the world's catching up in terms of, now granted, the facade, to have those extra uh, fins on there, it is certainly a benefit over having a pure glass facade, but it is more expensive than if you did a facade that had windows punched into a solid surface, but then you wouldn't be able to meet your architectural objectives. Mm -hmm. So I would say the only thing that costs more is that system because of the aspirations of the project were more, but otherwise the systems, mm -hmm. the idea of how everything else, nothing is really more. Yeah, and I, I, I think if I were to think on the sustainability side, I think there are some things I think could have been pushed, pushed harder. Um, uh, we would have loved to have natural ventilation in the atrium and, and all the entire office wing mm -hmm. to be naturally ventilated so that the only thing that would be uh, breathing would wouldn't be breathing off of outside air would be the, the high energy part of the right, lab wing. Right, right, right. This is something we pushed it. We right. had air up. We right. you know we couldn't quite get it all the way there. I think maybe if we get a next building at some point, yeah, I go. think we can we can maybe push that. And uh, so I think Northeastern was willing to go really far, but right. there's some places I think they're very cautious. Well, there, it's, there's, there's, so many, there's so many pressures on, yeah. on this kind of development. Um, you had a question, yeah. The question was, uh, what's the imp do we see any impact of Ruggles uh, and their evolution on, our, on this master plan? 
The one thing that's happening now is there's a platform extension project going on that will exit through the, the back of this project. Otherwise, we're pretty much, I, we were considering that the garages, the Renaissance garage and the Columbus garage, kind of pinning us in there. So we haven't thought much beyond that. That's why we thought there was so much importance of this site doing what it could. I think the pedestrian bridge that is just on the other side of the architecture building now, um, that's going to come off. And this will be replaced by this one. Mm -hmm. Any other, other questions from you guys? Okay, well, please, thank you guys very, very much. For